They add lift. It's pretty simple stuff. They add a dynamic stability that keeps the boat steady on the water. They reduce redded surface. They do a whole bunch of things um, that he must have figured out, or it was a good thing, obviously. I'm amazed today when I see fast boats without them. I don't, when they're created by people who should know better, in my opinion. And my friend Dan Savitsky thinks so, too. The, the cool thing is, one of the cool things, and I get a little nerdy here, I apologize. The simple dihedral angle of the bottom is, the, is really the key to it all. It, it gives the boat a better ride, because it's sharper, of course, uh, and more dynamic stability, really because of the same reason that an airplane has di dihedral in its wings. When you look out the window of any airplane that you're going to fly on, mostly the wings go up. That's a stable shape. The only airplanes that have horizontal wings are the ones that are incredibly maneuverable, like fighter planes and so forth, and you can barely fly the things. How much of this theory Ray grasped, I don't know. But boy, he, know how, he, he sure how, showed that it worked well. And today, after 50 years, really, the same basic shapes of that bottom lines plan are still in use on the fastest offshore boats. And no one has come up with a, a better shape for speed in rough water that is as simple and as reliable and as practical as Ray's deep V. I mean, you've got hovercraft, hydrofoils, catamarans, trimarans, all kinds of things. But they're expensive, or they're fragile, or, or they really only work in certain circumstances. The deep V is universally useful and practical. OK, enough of the nerdy stuff. Here's, here was one of the early deep Vs, probably built right here in uh, the New Bedford area, a little glass boat. The first one was built by the Whartons in Jamestown, Rhode Island. Dyer built some more after that, and they showed up at the America's Cup in 1958. Dick Bertram noticed. And he had Ray build design, and he built the 30-footer, which became the Bertram 31, and the first one was known as Moppy, named after his wife. That was her nickname. And it's a pretty familiar story, I know, today. But here's Carlton Mitchell's account from Sports Illustrated in 1960. Carlton Mitchell went along to write the story of the Miami-Nassau race, and he went on Dick's boat. He said, in government cut, the water lay smooth. And aboard Dick Bertram's moppy, I was slammed back into my chair as Sam Griffith gunned the engines. The fleet dropped astern in the wake stretched like a fat, fat, a wide road back towards our nearest competitors, a road that grew steadily longer. Dick and I looked at each other in amazement as the gap opened. We grinned. We had believed other boats would be faster in calm waters and based our victory hopes on the performance of our V-stern hunt design in the heavy seas on the open ocean in the Bahama Bank. But Moppy was taking them in the calm water inside the cut. In the Gulf Stream, in the steep, confused seas, Moppy came into her own. With minutes, within minutes, the fe fleet had dwindled to dots wreathed in spray, long before the skyline of Miami Beach dropped below the horizon. The other boats were out of sight. Eight hours later, to the minute, we roared past the finish line off Coral Harbor. Aqua Hunter, another hunt DV, was second, two hours later. The rest of the fleet, those that weren't forced out by the rough seas, finished the next day. <laughs> in 160 miles of grueling punishment, the roughest race in the history at that time, Moppy had set a new world record. And with it, the Bertram Yacht Company was born. This is the iconic Bertram 31. Um, they built thousands. They tried to put it out of production, and they had to bring it back. And then out in the boondocks, they really are sought after. For the 40th anniversary of Boating Magazine, that was the boat that they picked as the greatest boat of our time. And truly, because of its influence, absolutely, no question. It is. I mentioned earlier that Ray had two great disappointments in his career. The first was Easterner, and was followed by huge successes in the five and a half meters. Then the victory with the Bertram race boats and all that year after year. So the second dis disappointment, I, had to, to, I think, had to have been much worse for him. He filed for 
and received a patent on the deep V hull. And the royalties rolled in. Then someone discovered an article in the Skipper magazine published over a year prior to the filing. And under the concept of prior disclosure, Ray's patent was overturned. That was the article. Although it did not diminish the magnitude of the creation of the deep V, which was really a total paradigm shift for powerboats, it certainly limited the financial rewards he was due. But the design commissions kept coming, and a variety of boats were designed and detailed by Ray and his disciples. This is Stingray, 56-footer built by um, the Whartons again. Um, I saw it uh, just a few weeks ago at the Palm Beach Boat Show. It's sort of painted an icky light yellow. But it's under about its third refit. It's beautiful. And it's for sale, of course. It was done over recently by the Brooklyn Boat Yard, and they did a lovely job. This was drawn by Fenwick Williams, the nearsighted boat designer. Um, other disciples um, who drew, drew boats following that, um, like this one, Momiji, a Bertram International, built in Japan out of wood. Uh, drawn by John Decknatel, uh, Ted Burgess, Mark Ellis, you might know Mark from another boat design, Charlie Janis, um, all excellent designers, and a crew that still goes to work every day. Uh, Peter Boyce, Steve Weld, Craig O'Bara, Bob Provincial, they all did some beautiful work. And, and some of the drawings for these boats are exquisite and would make a lovely exhibit, Jim. <laughs> you could use somebody else's drawings too, but we'll give you a lot. <laughs> this is Gypsy Girl. This is built for Max Aiken, Sir Max Aiken, who was the son of Lord Beaverbrook. Max was a uh, Spitfire pilot and a newspaper man, and he liked fast boats, both power and sail. He had a Hunt sailboat, too. This boat wound up supposedly smuggling cigarettes from Gibraltar or from Morocco to Gibraltar. That was it. That's what happens when you, the old race boats. There's some miscellaneous projects here, which it tells you, again, Ray's Creative mind never stopped. This is a fast offshore lobster boat to get to the, to the, to the, to the offshore lobster population, which was, wasn't just, oh, people weren't aware of that until the 60s. Uh, a preacher lobsterman named Bill Whipple from Marblehead originally and then Westport, he came to Ray in the early 60s to give him a faster lobster boat than the traditional boat because they had to go so far offshore. So it was one of Ray's deep bees built by Alan Vices over in Mattapoisett. Cruised at about 20 knots, with one big Detroit diesel in it. And to improve on the process of setting strings of traps in deep water, they developed the first open transom that became standard on lobster boats ever since. I love this cartoon. It's from the old national uh, Maine Coast fisherman in those days, Dud Sinker. The deep V lobster boat never really caught on here because lobstermen like these two guys on the right over here um, are very traditional bound. Um, but down in Australia, the deep V lobster boats are standard equipment. Now here's a real Ray thing, trailer boats. <laughs> it's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> And it's another result of observation. Have you ever watched your dinghy when you've towed it? Sure, we all have. But I'll re bet Ray did and thought, what happens if I go faster? And then I go faster. So then he started towing around a whole boat behind another boat. And if one works, well, why not two? Ray was never afraid of making prototypes, and somehow, somewhere he found the money, or spent somebody's money, and he did it. At some, this is pretty remarkable stuff. At some speeds, the trailer boat would actually push the tow boat as it rode down the stern wave. It's a, kind of an early Prius, right? <laughs> Rumor is 
He had some CIA, CIA money funding the project. They had some boats they wanted to tow around extra fuel tanks with and then with explosive bolts or something blow them off and go off and do whatever they were doing. Um, not too much came of it. Bill Whipple did, did build one and use one for taking lobster pot traps out to the deep waters um, and lost one at sea. I took the idea back to uh, Special Operations down, Command down in Tampa a couple of years ago uh, and got an audience with a couple of SEAL types to say, hey, wouldn't this be a cool idea for you? And they kind of liked it, but they didn't have any money. Um, so we need some investors or we need our congressional delegation that claims they don't do earmarks to get, get us an earmark and we'll build some. Here's the cat rig on uh, Harrier. How are we doing? Um, the, the Ray's, there's enough topics with Ray's to go on forever. He liked to play with that. Um, it, in the latter years, he, he teamed up with Phil Weld. You probably, some of you know who Phil Weld was. Um, and that's a, quite a pair of, Yan of Yankees. When they go, those two guys got together in the office, that was a little odd. Phil wanted to do the O-Star single-handed transatlantic race in a multi-hull and then take the outboard hulls off of his trimaran and sail the mono hull around the world in another race. I can't remember which one it was. Do you remember, Peter? Don't remember. You did most of the drawings, I know. Um, so Ray's idea was for a cat-rigged, mast-aft, quadrilateral jib on a 110, I mean a 1010 hull, now we're talking a 70-foot 110, and then a couple of regular 110s as the other part of the trimaran. Well, why not? Sounded like a one Ray's idea. Well, it never happened, mostly due to a couple of strong personalities, Ray and Phil. R Phil ultimately won the 1980 O-Star, in a Dick Newick design try called Moxie. Probably you remember that. And right to the end, Ray was working with other projects. Water ballast was a big thing with Ray. Uh, he tried it both in sailboats and motorboats. Good idea. There's a lot. When you're on a boat, you've got a lot of water around, so why not? So, what is Ray Hunt's legacy? God, it's a lot, isn't it? An amazing record of sailing success. Uh, the beautiful Concordias. The tens, 110 to 1010. Uh, the modern spinnaker, the world champion five and a half meters, the Boston Whaler, and the Deep V, the really big one. I mean, what an incredible varied product of a life in, in boat design. I mean, virtually every small powerboat today, from 10 feet to 100 feet, is a result of <coughs> Ray's designing. <coughs> I can't think of any designer has success like that. And when I look back <clears throat> on my career, I think the one of the best days of my life was when I walked into 54 Lewis Wharf and asked for a job. And they got me one. So that's really the story of Ray Hunt. The little, this little, little Surf 125, and I know some of you folks have got one of these, is sort of the epitome of his boats today. And there's no better boat on Buzzards Bay than that little 25-footer. Um, I can stop here or I can show you some more uh, product of our uh, work after Ray, if you will. Go for, it. Go for it. I love this picture of Ray. It's fi hard to find a, one of him smiling. Did you notice? There was one back in the Bahamas. <laughs> but here he is. I like that one. So at Hunt Design, um, we've taken Ray's basic concept. I mean, we're not nearly anywhere near as creative as Ray. We take the deep V and we turn it into what our customers want. Here's a partial list of our clients. You'll uh, recognize names there for sure. These are production boat builders for the most part, some custom boat builders. We even have one client now in Abu Dhabi, Emotion Marine. We designed a boat for them, it's called a Voodoo. <laughs> this is a Roballo, this is the very first Roballo. They built a whole co boat company around, around this. this was the, I put this here because this is what Ray would have thought the, the larger whalers should have been. Relatively low dead rise 
aft sharp forward. <coughs> this is uh, an East Bay 38, which is kind of an iconic boat these days. It was really the first of what I call the blue boats that were, or the, or the conservative, I mean, the magazines call them down east boats, which I hate as a, as a handle, but um, high performance uh, sort of Yankee boats. And we've done all the East Bay designs. We've done all the Grady White designs for years and years and years, and it's very typical of the production boat business. Nice people at Grady White. They pay their bills promptly. And uh, Hunt Yachts, yes, another boat company with race name on it. And we started this company in 1998. Uh, and I switched on, it was a good idea. I don't know, it's a midlife crisis, I claim sometimes, sometimes for insanity. Um, we started with Korea here in, in South Dartmouth, and, and Ray Hunt second, was racy. Um, he, he was uh, there at the beginning, and still with us as our chief engineer. Um, like his grandfather, he his grandfather was a bunch of, he keeps us in the details. Um, so we've been doing this for a while now. Uh, here's custom boat. Um, Whistler, it's we do a lot of I know our husband ship here in Hong Kong, probably one of the nicest boaters in the world. Builders. Not a very good boat for the most easy store for long. Very pretty. Built for the owners, the owners of Hallmark Lines. Here's a similar boat that should be sent for a lot of people. Um Believe it or not, it doesn't cost quite much. This is a 72-footer uh, um, classic. I like it. Kind of a kind of recreation of the father of the Here's a 100 plus. Lyman Force. 